You're very welcome to the RTE Rugby Podcast. I'm Michael Glennon. We're joined today by the usual suspects, Don Lennon, Bernard Jackman, and RTE Rugby producer, Wes Liddy. Later on, we'll chat to Racing 92 attack and backs coach, Mike Prendergast. But we're going to start off with the Bledisloe Cup. We had rugby back um, in front of crowds. Uh, no, no better match, I suppose, than New Zealand and Australia to, to kick us off. Um, first of all, lads, I might just get your thoughts on the match itself, but also the bigger consequences of, of getting back to normality with a, with a big game such as the Bledis Low Cup. Uh, look, I watched the match there on, on, on Sunday morning. It says something when uh, I wasn't even aware over the weekend that the game was on. Uh, I saw some talk of the Bledis Low Cup, but it seemed to drop out of nowhere. Uh, so I watched the game on Sunday and what a cracking game. Firstly, to see crowds at a match, uh, you know, given all the, the Pro 14 games and the, the Premiership games in England that we've been watching, you're not used to seeing crowds. And it was, it was refreshing to see that for a start. Uh, secondly, it was interesting because um, for both coaches and both teams, when you consider neither New Zealand or Australia had played a game since the World Cup uh, almost 12 months ago, Phenomenal to see both sides out of action since then. You have two new coaches as well, Ian Foster taking over New Zealand and doing so uh, in a hostile background in that a lot of people in New Zealand felt he shouldn't have got the job. Uh, Scott Robertson from the Crusaders was the people's choice, if you like. He's sort of the, uh, the young upcoming coach. We've seen the Crusaders, how brilliant they've been over the past number of years in Super Rugby. Uh, so Foster under pressure coming into the job. On the other hand, you Dave Rennie, who we know well on this side of the world, had been the coach of the uh, uh, of the the Warriors, the Glasgow Warriors, for the past number of years. Coming into Australia at a very difficult time, a lot of issues in the background. The Australian rugby, also huge animosity between New Zealand and rugby uh, at union level in terms of um, the development of Super Rugby and where it goes from here. So the background to the game alone was, was fascinating. And then to get a contest 16 all at full, you know, with, with going into injury time, Australia have a penalty to win. Ball comes back off the goalpost. And incredibly, the ball is in play for another nine minutes. Uh, both teams could want it. A fascinating thing for me, and Bert should be interested in your, your thoughts on this, to see two attacking units within 15 metres of the opposition goal line. And at no stage, neither halfback dropped in to take a drop goal to win the game, which I thought was incredible. I thought New Zealand had learned that lesson back in 2007 at the World Cup in, in Cardiff when they were beaten by France. We saw Dan Carter, if you like, had brought that into the new era, uh, the, the 2015 final against Australia when the Aussies were coming back into the game. He took the option of a drop goal. I couldn't believe that neither halfbacks looked to win the game. Uh, I mean, what's the difference winning the game with a penalty and a drop goal? Incredible. But what a fantastic game. Yeah, I think that's definitely something both coaches, Donald, will, will have talked about this week. And you're right, the All Blacks, at their core, their philosophy is, oh, we're good enough to go and, and win it with a try. But, um, and, and they learned hard lessons from 2007. And we saw that at times over in the following years when they needed it, they weren't shy about taking a drop goal to either build a scoreline or, or to win a game. But it was actually criminal watching. I'm sure both coaches... Now, look, at I'd say, to be honest, Rennie, Rennie's obviously completely new. Foster's been an assistant coach. But definitely in the review, they would have talked around, you know, the ability to, um, to have a shot at goal from, from a drop goal. Uh, the All Blacks, they generally are quick learners. Um... And I wouldn't be, you know, I'd be absolutely shocked if this weekend, if, if it, the end game is the same, that they wouldn't go and, and, and at least set up for, for the drop goal and try and execute it. But a uh, great game of rugby and it's great to see Australia. Look, at the big challenge is kind of backing up this week. But, you know, I think Dave Rennie's a, an excellent coach. It's been a difficult time in Australian rugby with, with obviously a lot of financial issues and, and issues at board level. But um, a result like that will, will give them huge confidence and, uh I think we need a strong Australia. You know, it'd be terrible to see them start to um, to go away from being a, a real contender or tier one country. So um, it, it was it was definitely great, and I just yeah, just a brilliant game, crazy game, but uh, it was great to see it. Lads, just there was a piece on the website. Uh, Morris Brosnan was talking to three of the exiles. I suppose Jack Regan, who's just gone down to New Zealand, but uh, Ollie Yeager, who's been there 
for a longer period and Conan O'Donnell. Just some interesting quotes. Um, Ollie Jager was kind of half said in jest, but he says, I remember once at home I threw an offload behind my back and the coach came up and said that was awesome, but do it again and I'll drop you. And then Conan O'Donnell was talking about if he makes a line break, people don't give out to him over there. What is it about that mentality? It's kind of refreshing to hear that, but we're not used to that sort of... Um, we can see it manifest in the Irish teams that we've been watching. So is there anything we can do to move towards, towards that element that's so successful for New Zealand? Well, look, I'll go first, but uh, I'm disappointed to hear that that's the... That's the case um, at the moment in Irish rugby. I know we are conservative. I thought you were nature, coaching that team, Birch, no? Who? I thought you were coaching that team. He's talking about. <laughs> Maybe I should be more conservative. But, uh, <laughs> no, I, look, I think that if you look at a lot of the coaches, um, well, not a lot of coaches. McFarland definitely has a positive attitude to, to play. And, and um, Dwayne Peel, Lancaster gives the Leinster players a, a license to play. Um, Andy Friend and Pat Lamb before him. So... I think it's sometimes hard if you if you haven't made a breakthrough here uh, for whatever reason, and, and you go and you have a little bit of success somewhere else. It's easy to to throw knives, but like, like I'll be honest, and uh, uh, it's great to see the lads do really well. But you know, making a minor ten cup team isn't the same as as playing uh, making a starting team for your for your province. I, it's a great you know it's a great spectacle, um, but it's a mixture of semi pro. Um, you know, some amateur players being drafted in. It's great. It's absolutely brilliant. Hopefully, it's a launch pad for them. But um, I, I think that t- things have changed coaching wise. You look at some of the rugby's played in the in the Ulster Bank League. And guys are allowed to express themselves. So for ten, for sure, ten years ago, we had a very kind of uh, a strong focus on not making errors. Um, but I think a lot of coaches do give players the, the license to express themselves. I mean, that's my opinion on it. I'm, like, I'm open to, to hear what the rest of you think. I think it's a, sorry, guys, I think it's a different uh-huh. mindset right from the start in that, uh, you know, anybody who's been to New Zealand, you watch kids playing in schools, you watch them. I mean, they play rugby. They have a rugby ball the same way that, you know, kids in Cork or Tipperary or in Kelly carry a hurley. It's part and parcel of them from the time they grow up. They're encouraged in underage level. Uh, a lot of them even, you know, up to, like, they go out, they play in their, in their bare feet. Um, they're encouraged. There's no kicking in the, in the underage game up to about eight or nine years of age. They're always encouraged to improve their skill levels. Uh, and every time, you know, if they have a break at lunchtime, and you see this in all the kids in the schools, which is a rugby ball they have, and they're constantly working on their skills. So I think as a base... Uh, that's it's part and parcel of the game in New Zealand. Um, you know, I also think you, you bring that into the schools level over here. Certainly, uh, I know in Munster there's a huge emphasis in terms of um, the, the unit skills. In other words, the kids growing up, they learn how to scrum, they learn their line out, they learn how to lift, they learn their balling, they learn the, the key ingredients of the game. Whereas in New Zealand, it tends to centre on the individual skills and then it's built into the unit skills. Um, so from that point of view, the mindset is different. Like you watch it, you know, we, we, um, that North-South game, the, the New Zealand trial, where you had so many younger kids that we weren't even that familiar with. But the quality of the, uh, the offloading and the skill levels of the forwards in particular, the front fives, uh, it is at a different level. Uh, but that is something that's ingrained in them from a younger age. And I think that is why, you know, when you get younger players like Regan, uh, O'Donnell and Jaeger who go out to New Zealand, it's always the first thing that hits them, how they're encouraged to do those things. Um, so, I mean, it's a mindset. It's, it's, uh, but, I, you know, I think things are changing here. But by and large, uh, particularly New Zealand forwards, they have a skill set that our people have to work really hard on later in life to try and achieve it's something that they have almost naturally Wes should we be working on that you know should the coaches is there something in the infrastructure from the younger age that should be moving towards that direction well first of all I don't know what uh, point Donal was making about all these kids in Cork going around with Hurleys it's certainly not reflecting in results <laughs> the last while anyway but one all like, Ireland, one all Ireland, G. Vuts since 1973, and you're hanging on to it like. There's a few more to come, though. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
I, I, I think equally the flip side, it's telling that obviously the three lads didn't quite make the grade here. And as Bert said, they're, they're not playing necessarily at the very highest level in New Zealand all the time. But equally, it's three tight five forwards um, and, and two props. So, you know, I, I think possibly that points to the fact that, that the average player coming through the system here has certain elements of their skill set that are a little bit more developed possibly than their counterparts down there in terms of especially around the set piece. So... I mean, I suppose for the lads, if, if if they're strong in that area and they develop, you know, some other parts of their game down there and the confidence that comes with that, I mean, you'd think maybe they are guys that could come back and certainly be a, a third or fourth choice prop in a province. But um, reading that article, some of them seem quite happy where they are and, and, and don't really have any intention of coming back here. And at the minute, why would you really? It's probably the best place in the world you could be. Yeah, it's a pity. Maybe Jack Regan could come back and help awfully. Uh, you know, his dad won in All Ireland. But just, just, just uh, before we uh, we finish the point, uh, I also think it's important to see, like, um, well, we know Ali Yeager, he went there sort of after school, whereas uh, Jack Regan was in Leicester. Then he went up to Ulster. You had a uh, Conan O'Donnell was in the Connacht Academy. But you know, we know it's like people who. College and they do exams, do law, but that doesn't always mean they're going to end up uh, working in law. Um, you could do a commerce degree and end up doing something completely different. Uh, you know, I think there is worth the academy system here. Um, there's a there's it's it's a multifaceted discipline that they go through for three years, but they do even if they don't get a contract with one of the provinces here, they come out of it uh, with a very broad skill set. Um, and it's afforded those two young men the opportunity to travel the world. I mean, the fact that they were part of provincial academies in Ireland, I'm sure, was an attraction for uh, Otago and um, counties in, in O'Donnell's place for them to get an opportunity in the first place. So um, people see a, a kid who's gone through an academy and because he doesn't get a contract, almost as cheap, but... Um, no, there is something more tangible to that three-year stay that they own with the province, and it's helped them to forge a career. And, and as Bert said, who knows? Or, or, or as Wes said, how long will they stay there? They're having a great time down there. They're expanding um, their horizons in a number of areas, and I'm quite sure that will stand to them in whatever they, in the years to come. So, you know, um, there, there, is, there is a lot to commend a guy who's gone through the academy system. He does come out with it, uh, out of it with uh, a broad level at the end, regardless of whether he gets a contract here in Ireland or not. Very good. And when we move on to the Ireland squad now, there was um, six uncapped uh, guys named in it and originally, uh, originally, and Ryan Baird has had to, to pull out because of an injury. So you have Ed Byrne, Will Connor, Shane Daly, Hugo Keegan, and Jenison Gibson Park in. What do you make of that? It's only a week and a half, really, to the Italy match. Is now a time for a big kick in the arse to a lot of the players who have been struggling over the last couple of years in, you know, when you look at their previous high standards. There's the Six Nations on the line, but is this now a time to have a shock to the system, drop a couple of lads who were previously thought undroppable, or how do you see it playing out for the Italy game? Bernard? Yeah, look, I think for Italy, uh, for the Six Nations, I think, um, there's prize money. There's there's obviously maybe potentially a title on the line. So I think Farrell won't be um, thinking about experimenting too much. Uh, certainly for the for the competition that follows uh, in November, there may be some time opportunities to give players um, a chance. I think the most worrying thing is is probably when you look at that squad and then you try and nail down a, a starting team. There's a cup. There's a lot of positions that aren't clear cut, and that's never a good place for for you know an international side or, or any side you'd like to have I think you know 11 or 12 at least that you'd say right that's nailed on and then there's a couple of positions up for grabs so there's some doubts around players form wise there's obviously some injuries um, so I think it's quite a difficult uh, squad for Farrell to get together and the, the reality for him is he needs to probably get, get some positive results quite quite quickly because obviously new coach and staff um, coming off a, a an average World Cup, a poor World Cup, and then an only okay start to the Six Nations. So it's probably not a time for him to be too too ambitious in terms of experimenting. But I think it's a, it's a tough um, uh, deal he's been dealt because I just don't see um, that squad 
you know, I don't see a lot of guys in form or, or certainly for a position. Donald? Yeah, I think um, I, I, I agree with Birch. I, I think if you look back to 2017-18 when Ireland were, you know, flirting with number one in the world and you kind of looked at the team then and, and in every position there looked to be threats or guys that were amongst the best in the world in their position at the time and to be honest, between form and injuries, you just don't get that sense at all now. Um, I think they're very light in the front row. Um, I think Baird's injury, and I'm not sure what the position is with Henderson potentially missing a game, leaves them a bit light in the second row. I think you're looking at guys that were mainstays of the team, like like Peter O'Mahony, maybe Conor Murray. There's slight concerns about their form. Um, you know, I don't think a lot of guys have really put their hand up in massively since the lockdown ended, with with the possible exception of probably Bundy Aki is, is the one shooting the lights out. But, um, you know, even in the back three, you're, you're probably looking at a situation where a Hugo Keenan or a Shane Daly maybe makes his way into a team now um, with Larmer's injury and Keith Earls' injury. So, yeah, I mean, I, I I just don't think they're that strong. And I think if France pick up where they left off form-wise, it's going to be a really, really tough challenge for them. Yeah, I'd agree with those sentiments entirely. Um, you know, I was trying to pen an Irish team there before we uh, before we set up the podcast. And uh, all of a sudden, you were kind of scratching your head and saying, Jesus, there's uh, two or three options here. Um, and you weren't sure about any of them. And, uh, you know, I agree totally with Birch. Uh, you know, really 12 names, you should be slotting those in straight away and then it's an either or in the other ones. Uh, I think Ty Furlong is a huge loss. We saw what his absence meant for Leinster. Uh, he could have been the difference in that game against um, uh, Saracens in the, the quarterfinal of Europe. Um, Kean Healy and, and Andrew Porter, you know, they had a bad day. They out scrummage wise against uh, Saracens that day. Dave Kilcoyne was pushing well, but been injured since the first day of the year. I would have had no hesitation whatsoever in selecting Baird in the second row with James Ryan for the game against Italy. Whereas the following week, playing France in Paris, big physical side, you'd say, well, look, no, I wouldn't start him in that one. But it's it's academic now because we've just learned that he's he's out of contention because of an abductor injury. Um, the standouts for me, uh, I think Caelan Doris has to be in the side. I think, you know, Standing since the return to play, uh, which means that you know, uh, and and also CJ Stander being the standout monster player. So um, I think Peter Omani has a massive fight on his hands to try and get into the starting team as a consequence of that, because I think the seven jersey is between uh, Van der Fleer and Will Connors. Um, elsewhere, it's it's you know. Uh, all of a sudden, you get injuries in the back three. Johnny Sexton obviously will start as captain. Uh, but yeah, every or Murray been there for some time. Uh, even Craig Casey, I thought, was far more like the Craig Casey that we had seen at Irish under twenty in the game against him last week. Now he he won't be in contention, but people like Kieran Marmion are well back in contention now with Connacht. Gibson Park is. Uh, Looks as if he got hold of the number nine jersey at Leinster. So they will debate around scrum half. Uh, Aki, for me, again, agrees is, has to be in the side with Gary Ringrose. Uh, Conway will be in the back three, but, uh, you know, on form, Stockdale uh, hasn't, uh, doesn't inspire. But, you know, does he get selected because he's one of the senior players left now? Hugo Keane and I thought looked really uh, impressive in the games. Um, when he started out, I think he's probably a little bit of Shaley by virtue of the fact that he's had more experience. And Shane, I, I know Shane well. He's a fantastic young player, but I think they need to find a, a position for him. He's, uh, by trade, he's an outside centre who's played a lot at full back and has played on the wing. Um, at this stage, uh, sometimes you're penalised because you've got a very good skill set. I mean, he was, a, he was on the seventh circuit for for two years, but he was a forward. I mean, I, I remember talking to him about six or nine months ago. I was telling him his, his work at the breakdown is brilliant. His line-out work is superb. Scrummaging needs a bit of improvement, but I'm not quite sure was that good to for your chances of getting that at the centre for Munster. But, uh, you know, he has that range of skills. So uh, it's going to be challenging for Andy Farrell. And Baird as well. It's, this isn't a squad like you normally have because they're going to be cocooned in camp, 
more so than they've ever been before. In what's happened with the AI and the IRS soccer team and the challenging um, period that they've had. Now, I think it's slightly different with the soccer because players are coming from all over the UK and Ireland, coming in from different bubbles. Where, uh, our players are in their, their provincial bubbles and they're within Ireland. But um, who knows what's going to happen in the next two weeks in terms of the, the, the coronavirus seems to be striking everywhere. And that could well have maybe a bigger impact on selection than even injuries or form. We just have to wait and see. There's a lot of unknowns. Just to be interested, Donald, where, where do you see Daly's best position? I, I, you know, I, I'm impressed with my fullback. I, I've seen him play sevens. I mean, do you think, do you think he's a fullback or, or a 13 or a wing? Uh, I think he's a, a fullback. I've seen him play the centre. He's, he's, he's about six foot three. He's a big, strong lad. He has great pace. I think he tries and he's a little bit more space. Uh, he's rock solid under the high ball. He's a very good kicker. He played a lot of GA as a young lad, so that obviously stands to him as well. Uh, I think going forward, fullback is his position. Um, you know, he's a bit like Robbie Henshaw, really. I'd, I'd compare the two of them. Robbie, as a young player, played a lot of GA, was a fullback the whole way coming up, and, you know, ended up playing in the centre. Joe Schmitzon as sort of the parent for Brian O'Driscoll, and he was kind of fast tracked as a 13 and has ended up as a 12. Um, Shane could fall into the same category. Personally, I think he's full back. He's he needs a run of games, you know, and that's it's the same for any young. Uh, and that's why, you know, I send him. Um, I've been impressed with him every time he's been given an opportunity. It'll be uh, interesting, obviously, how they get in, in in training. Andy Farrell wouldn't know that much about them. So how they carry themselves in the next week or ten days is going to be hugely important. But um, I think going forward, Daly's a fullback. Yeah. Delighted now to be joined on the line by uh, Racing 92 backs and attack coach Mike Prendergast. Mike, uh, first of all, how are you? Good, thanks, Michael. Good. Um, down in Corsica at the moment, we, we came down here just to supposed to go into a bubble and eliminate any uh, dangers of, of the virus because obviously in um, around the world it's 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 a, it's a major problem in in Paris it's been quite bad circulating so um, the club had decided and the president decided to uh, to put us into a bubble so we we can now of course get to prepare for the week before we fly out on Friday to Bristol. Yeah, there's, it's no secret, Mike, that you've been um, that they were hit. The camp was hit by by COVID nineteen. The, the training grounds were shut down. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not an ideal preparation for building up for a big match. But you were out. You were in action over the weekend, and from what I saw from the highlights, you know, it put in a very good performance in a very close match against Toulouse. How did you think you you went on that account coming back your first match after? Yeah, the... yeah. As you said, it wasn't ideal. Obviously, we did, we did, we did, the game the previous week against La Rochelle was was cancelled. Um, with a number of cases, so we had to close the club down. There was no training, obviously. So we came back in on, on Thursday and Friday. Um, so we'd only two days to prepare. And considering, I suppose, there was only three players that played in the previous game. So we, we had a huge turnaround in our, in our team and our squad. It was the first time some of the, some of the boys had played and obviously played together. Um, and we were probably unlucky not to, not to come away with a victory against a very good Toulouse side. Um, so the boys get very good count of themselves, played well, um, managed the game well. And considering, I suppose the the week that we'd had, I know I know Munster had a similar situation that they weren't in training until Thursday. So I'm sure they could relate to it, um, especially as I said, with a team that hadn't played together. But look, uh, the biggest thing I suppose we were able to get out there and get on the pitch again. And um, even this week, we've players just back in reintegrating in the group again. Um, to hopefully prepare for, for the final. Some of the players will be involved, some won't. So um, we just have had to adapt um, and, and deal with it as best we can, you know. And I think coming away for a week like this has been a good thing as well. Um, because, look, we would have been away from each other. Obviously, there were some personnel that weren't with us for the last couple of weeks. So it's good to have everyone back in. Um, and it, it allows you that, that extra bit of time together. And even off the pitch stuff and having little conversations and... You know, just getting that bit of extra video work in. So it's so it's been good in terms of, I suppose, what's ha what's happened in the previous weeks. And I know over in France, like here, 
people, it's, things change every day, but over in France, it's particularly bad. So your situation there in Paris, it must be difficult at the moment with, with you and your family as well. Yeah, it, it hasn't been easy, to be honest, Joe. It has, it's not easy for anyone. Um, I suppose the only positive thing from, from ourselves is we're, we're, we're still able to work, we're still able to go to training and, and, and prepare for, for, um, for the matches on the weekend. From the family point of view, I suppose a lot more is restricted. Um, and I suppose you're going through a, a bit of a quiet life at the moment. And look, it's, it's, I know it's the same at home, it's the same everywhere. And we just got to get on with it and, and, and keep as safe as we can. There's a, probably there's some old lazy cliches about French teams maybe not having ideal preparations, but being able to turn it on on the day. Is there any way you can turn that to your advantage that obviously with the preparations have been hit, but there is that within traditional French teams. We see the national mm -hmm. teams that when they put their mind to it, it can, they can come out with an extraordinary performance that wasn't evident in the build-up. Yeah, yeah. I think, to be fair, our build-up and our, our consistency has been quite good for the last for the last while, to be honest, in terms of last season, the start of this season. So, obviously, we have had something to deal with over the last few weeks. But I, I don't think things will change from that point of view. We've, um, you know, in terms of personnel, it's we've everyone back in at the moment, which is good. Um, and I suppose leading up to that, we'd, we'd four or five big games, well, because we'd big top 14 games, which, which we really targeted as well, because this time last year, we'd a, we'd a slow enough start to the, to the campaign albeit we lost our, our internationals to the World Cup, but it would be still high standards here and we weren't going well. So we targeted a good start to the league and then obviously we went to Clermont to win and won and, and Saracen. So there were four big games and, um, you know, we, I suppose we'd originally planned to, to, to rest some of the players the following weeks. So um, in terms of, uh, I suppose, our process, it, I, I don't think it'll change a huge amount. There's, there's, there's a very good uh, mentality in this group. There's a very good atmosphere in this group. Um, and the one thing I did notice, and I've, I've, I've alluded to before, was I did see a big change in terms of um, last year. I remember we played Saracen in our first Champions Cup game and just everything ramped up and, you know, traditionally, and I suppose clubs I'd been with previous, albeit it wasn't in the Champions Cup, it was in the Challenge Cup, it was maybe weeks that we'd, you know, I suppose it, 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 the bar wasn't pushed, maybe that in terms of where it should have been, whereas with Racing, I saw the absolute opposite, you know, they, they, um, they value, I think, the Champions Cup as much as the top 14 and I think that showed over the last couple of years, we, we've been in two finals. Um, so in terms of our process, absolutely, there has been adaption because of what's happened in the last couple of weeks. But I don't think it's anything that will, you know, uh, motivate, motivate them more or, or not because they're, they're quite a motivated group that, I suppose, know there's a process there and, and not to change things. I was just going to ask about that because in the past, again, French sides wouldn't have, compared to the French Championship, the top 14, that would have been the main thing kind of there mm. All-Ireland. Uh, mm -hmm. Final, but Racing obviously have have really worked hard in Europe to get where they are. Mm -hmm. Is there a, would the timing of this with the delay and it coming early in your season be mm -hmm. an advantage? In, in contrast to Exeter, who have a, a Premiership final coming up, Is, can you look at it like that? Um, yeah, look, I suppose from our point of view, and that's all I suppose that that I can that I can speak about or vouch for is um, even during the pre season, we knew we had a quarter final to you know I I, I know. Some people were asking me previous to this and coming into the quarter final was it was it different? It, of course, it was different. Your quarter final in four games in, and um, but it was the same for everybody. But I just think it gave us a massive uh, focus during, which was quite a long pre season, which we don't usually have over here in 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 the top fourteen, especially in uh, in, um, in in wrestling, because traditionally they've been getting. To semi-finals and, and finals or quarter-finals so the season's going down long um, and they go back a bit later so it was like for everybody it was, it was it was a different season towards the end of last season and kicking into this season but it's, it gave us a huge really I think sharpened our minds in terms of um, you know we came out of a hard pool which are the Ospreys obviously Munsters and Saracens and then we had we had a quarter-final to, to look forward to so it was something um, it was something new but it gave us, it really sharpened our, our focus in, in, in what was coming around the corner, you know. So, um, yeah. 
how do the two Irish guys fit in there? I remember years ago when Trevor Brennan moved to France, he described himself as a piece of a jigsaw, you know, that maybe he didn't mm. fit somewhere, but he fit in that Toulouse team. How are the two guys fitting in? How are their characteristics shining through, especially in this sort of time um, mm -hmm. when the whole world is kind of upside down? What do Simon and Dunica bring to the, to the club off the field? Actually, two, two, uh, two things that really stand out. I think one is a calmness. Um, I suppose from Dunica and, and the other one is a, a, a positive side from both of them. But, mm. you know, Simon's personality, he's just, he's a very positive guy. Um, he's been out for a while, obviously. Um, we obviously didn't play through, through, through the lockdown. But in terms of, sorry, he was injured previous to, to the lockdown for about two or three months. He came back during the summer. He had another injury, um, which knocked him back. And his first game was actually the quarterfinal of the, um, of the Champions Cup, yeah. which... He played for me for a guy that hadn't played in seven or eight months at a, at a, at a very, very good game. Um, and then in the semi final, same thing as well, especially against a team like Saracens that, you know, the kick contested being the kick quite short. So he had a lot to deal with, and I thought he dealt with it very well, considering the number of, of months he'd been out and the, and the high level of games you're going straight into. You know, he didn't have a, a you know, a pre season game or two to, to, to kind of, I suppose, find his, his form but fortunately enough for us he did so in terms of form wise he's been excellent and as I said just think an incredibly positive guy anyone that knows him you can see he plays with a smile on his face and there is that good kind of atmosphere and, and ambience as we call it here that there is that those positive vibes and he adds that massively and then Dunica just just brings a calmness and experience head on him and he's, he's rugby intellect his rugby IQ is is right up there, you know, um, and it's something that is massively appreciated here in terms of the staff ourselves. He's like effectively having another coach, which is a massive thing. Um, but also, I think the, the rugby intellect and the rugby knowledge he's passing on to players, like you look at things like, you know, it, it doesn't happen by accident as well. He works, he works very hard off the pitch in terms of his video analysis. And I know the boys at home in, in Munster and Ireland would vouch for that. And fortunately, they see it here as well, how much information he's passing on. So he's actually growing people like our line-out callers. Um, I do the ruck, for instance, and usually it's, a, I think, a, a forwards role more so, but I was fortunate to, to work with Paul O'Connell in, in Stade Francais, and I, I, I took my, my bits and pieces around, um, around the ruck from him. And, and like that, Dunica has other little bits and pieces and ideas that, you know, that he's willing to... to to share with us as a coaching group and, and we listen. So he's, a, he's been a huge influence over here, um, both on and off the pitch. And both of them have, in fact, for, you know, for, as I said, from a positive point of view and then that rugby intellect. I won't ask you for any of your strike plays or your, secret, uh, your secrets for the match, but what gives you most confidence about your chances uh, on Saturday? Um, I think just the, the, I suppose the form we've been in and even last week, as I said, um, you know, there was a lot of changes. There was 12 starters and a full new bench. So um, that continuity, so we've been consistent and, and, and we need to be because we're probably coming up against a team that have been, you know, a, a team that's massively consistent and that shows by they're in their fifth Premiership final, but obviously in a, in a European Cup final now as well. Um, but I suppose, look, the, the things that would excite me is, is the game itself. You have two teams that go out and like to express themselves and that's something that, that we want to do. And I suppose we have the players to do it. Um, but it's about performing it under pressure at the big stage. And, um, you know, we can say we want to go out and hold on to the ball. And I'm sure they're, they're, they're saying the same things, but it, it's how it's done. And, you know, it'll start with the collisions and around the rock. And if we can generate that quick ball, it will allow us to play on the front foot with the guys that are, you know, players that are, that are in form or, and that have got the, the profile that can, I suppose, create problems and ask questions in the likes of, Finn Russell and Virani Vakatawa and Simon and these guys, you know, but it'll start with the platform up front, like it does in every game, Michael. And I think, you know, you look at you look at Exeter, they're an incredibly well drilled um, team up front. They've got a very set, solid set, set piece, sorry. Um, and one thing we've 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 noticed, and I'm sure every team is as well, you've got to keep them out of the, out of your 22, you know. So we've got to be very disciplined around the park, not to allow them easy ins in terms of penalties to kick to the corner. Um, and obviously, then they have that, that attacking threat as well, and not too dissimilar to ourselves in terms of in terms of a very potent back three. So we got to kick very, I suppose, uh, precisely. Um, not give them 
you know, easy ball to counter-attack from because, as I said, with Hogg and Jack Nowell and O'Flaherty and these guys, they've, uh, they've a good balance to their team, you know. So, but getting back to your question, I suppose, what, what, what excites me is, I suppose, the challenge and you're looking at different little, I suppose, nuggets and, and ins on their, their defence, which is a very good, they're a very good defensive team, but there is a few little bits and beasts that we've, we've seen. So, Hopefully we have the um, the decision making right and the mentality right on the day, you know. Very good. Listen, Michael, I'll let you go there. Thanks very much for your time and joining the RT Rugby podcast. So best of luck on Saturday and hope all goes well. Thanks, William. Michael. Cheers. All the best. Yeah, great to hear from Mike there, uh, head of the match, lads. How do you see this game playing out? Is it too easy to throw the cliche about the French having problems travelling, or what way do you see it going? Um, look, I don't think the uh, the travel will be an issue for them anymore. There's no, there's no home crowd, um, and you know, Racing are a very experienced squad, both in terms of European rugby now, um, but also the huge amount of international experience. So I think they've, they've developed um, uh, an ability to to go away from home. They've been building towards lifting European trophy. Played very well in the final um, against Leinster and Bilbao a couple of years ago. Have added to the squad. Um, you know, speaking to, to Prendergast, um, they've got a really strong culture there, a real sense of identity and a real club-like mentality. And, and Mike's been, this is Mike's fourth club in France, and he said it's the only one that in any way is similar to Munster in terms of the team spirit and uh, I suppose the, the love for the jersey. So um, they're, in a, they're in a good place. Um, Exeter are very impressive as well, and they've likewise been building building towards this. Uh, I watched them against Bath at the weekend in a in the semi final, and, and they you know they they won comprehensively impressive against Toulouse. So it's two unbelievable teams. I think Exeter have or sorry Exeter probably have more controlling halfbacks. I know Finn Russell is is phenomenally talented, <laughs> but you know in a in a knockout game with a against a team as as organised in terms of their kicking game and organised in terms of their defence. Um, as Exeter, it might just come down to, to game management and not overplaying your hand. And um, for me, I think that could that could uh, make play in, in Exeter's favour. And I think uh, for me, they're slight favourites to be honest. Yeah, um, I'm only disappointed that Hugh has done a runner today because uh, I think Birch and I tipped um, Racine and Exeter to win their respective semi-finals. Uh, Hugh had tipped Toulouse. Uh, it shows you what a lousy loser he is that he just fecks off and uh, this thing comes up for discussion. But anyway, um, yeah, look, it's, it's, it's a fascinating contest in so many ways. It's a pity there won't be anybody at it. Uh, the 25th year of Heineken Cup rugby um, and there's going to be a new name on the trophy. There's only 11 winners in the 24 seasons to date. So uh, I think that's good for the tournament, firstly. Uh, I think both sides... Um, they're, they're, they're two totally different teams in, in, in many ways um, I think going into the semi-final I would have fancied running to win the thing out uh, having watched them against Saracens I was slightly disappointed with the Saracens the week after Leinster they had them on the rack for a long period of time uh, you know a piece of genius by Farrell Vakatoa and, and Imhoff scored the try that won the game at the end uh, I think Exeter uh, are an amazing team, an amazing club. I mean, we know the history, how they came up from the championship 10 or 15 years ago. They built their way slowly towards contention for the premiership in England. Uh, struggled to do anything in Europe, really. Um, but I think, uh, but for Saracens, as we know, they would have won two or three premierships by now. They did win one. Uh, they're in the final and are, are favourites for that as well. Um, I think they, they've, they've been very rounded side uh, and I think Johnny Gray and Stuart Hogg, two additions from Scotland, have, have added two even more ingredients to what they have. Um, if, uh, I think, you know, we don't know what impact this COVID uh, issue has had in Racine over the past two weeks, but in a game that was going to be tied to start off, you would expect uh, that that would have handed Exeter a little bit of an advantage. So I'd go for Exeter to win it. But I think Racine have so much of an X factor about them and they're so brilliant to watch that, you know, there, there'll be nothing between them. I wouldn't write them off. Uh, either way, whoever wins it, uh, you know, I've been in, I saw Leinster beat Exeter in Sandy Park two years ago. I saw Munster draw there. They're a fantastic crowd. 
They're old school supporters, brilliant in every way. Uh, likewise, Racine, I must say, uh, I go back to that horrible day uh, when, uh, you know, uh, Munster were to play Racine and uh, Anthony Foley sadly passed away that morning. The reaction of the Racine people, the reaction of the Racine players. I remember Jackie uh, Lorenzetti, the owner of Racine, um, coming up to me. I was doing a piece for Sky at the side of the pitch and, you know, it was, uh, everybody was in shock, a really emotional time. But the way that Racine carried themselves throughout that period and, you know, there's been a special relationship between Munster and Racine because of what happened out there. Uh, I certainly, and, and, you know, that's without even mentioning Dunica Ryan, Mike Prendergast and Simon Zevo. So there's obviously a monster connection there as well. So you'd love to see them win it for all kinds of reasons. So um, I think for once it's nice to be a neutral, to sit back, to watch a final. Uh, I was in Bilbao as Bernard was uh, for the game against Racing uh, or against uh, Leinster. And they really had Leinster to the pin of their collar, despite the fact that I think Dan Carter had cried off injured. Uh, they had a number of injuries on the day. And they nearly won it. So uh, very difficult to call. But I think Exeter probably have that little bit of a margin ahead of them. Wes? Yeah, I'd go along with, with the lads mostly. The, um, I suppose I, I did think Racing struggled a bit more than I thought they would with Saris, um, especially considering what Saris had been through the previous week. And I suppose Exeter can, can bring a version of that, probably not quite as, as, as good a version as Saris, but... Um, the, the flip side to that is just the amount of individual talent and in that racing backline just means they're they're never really out of it. So very finely balanced. I'd love to see Exeter win a trophy, um, the Premiership hopefully, um, and I'd like to see the three Irish lads get their hands on the Champions Cup. But I think bo both clubs on a mission, kind of um, both clubs that have put a lot into this tournament, which again is important because we have seen the tournament's profile watered down a small bit in recent years. So that that two big teams here, you know, arguably the top teams in either country are actually act, actively targeting this tournament and one of them's going to win it can only boost the tournament itself in the long run. So, um, yeah, I, I'll say Racing with the, the heart rather than the head, but I'd love to see, uh, I think Dunica Ryan and Zebo would be, you know, had a lot of near misses. Dunnock Ryan was on the bench in 2008. Did, did he feel part of that? I'm not sure. And uh, obviously, Prendy would love to see get their hands on it as well. They're in Corsica training this week, so they've had a nice build up anyway, uh, COVID aside. That's grand. Bernard, did you give your prediction there? Yeah, I, I, I'd love to. I like Wesley for, for Prendy and the lads. Um, you know, I, I'd love to see Rassi win it, but I just think Exeter um, might just get the job done. That's great. Gentlemen, thanks very much for your time. Uh, we'll call it a day there. And thanks very much to Mike Prendergast as well for dropping in. Uh, and you can, this podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll chat to you next week. Thanks.